<laughs> yeah, it's so funny. One of the one of the people I was in a meeting with earlier today, and he was the only person who wasn't a father on this call. Mm-hmm. I was saying, I hope you all have a, a peaceful weekend for Father's Day. And we're all looking at him like, you're the only one who's going to have a peaceful weekend. Uh, you who has no kids. <laughs> yeah, true, true. I was telling somebody, um, you know, my kids are grown, right? My youngest is 24. And um, and I've got a buddy who's my age, and he has a five-year-old. Five-year-old, a 57-year-old. It's crazy. And... Uh, I was, I was talking to somebody, I'm like, for a billion dollars, if, if somebody said, Ron, you have to raise another child, you have to have high chairs with peas smeared all over that, you have to clean the kitchen up, you have to go to um, parent-teacher meetings, you have to take kids to Disneyland, you, you had to raise another child. I'm like, not a chance in the world, not for a billion dollars. <laughs> you no, know, it was the best time of my life. I loved it, but I would not change my lifestyle now to go do it again. Uh-uh. Yeah, no no way. Way. My, my wife started talking about having a fourth kid. Uh, mm. uh, <laughs> where's, where's the number to the divorce attorney? Where does it go? No, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, my dad has a joke. My dad has a joke. A little, little short Jamaican. He's like, the, every time my, my wife or my significant other always want another child, I'm like, now's the time for you to go have an affair. <laughs> He's like, I'm not doing it. You do it with somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, kids! Nah, I'm always back and forth. I, one of my best friends, he's uh, he, he's what, 46, 47. He's got a three year old, and he's just like, oh my goodness, you know, because he's just, he goes, why did I? I don't know if he actually said, why did I wait so long, but you could hear it in his tone. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's your first or second, absolutely at any age. But man, after I've raised a few. I'm like, I can't go back and do it again. Mm-mm. Yeah. And you had two? I had five over the course of my life. Five. Five. I'm all boys. Okay. Five boys. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Good for you, man. That's awesome. Yeah. I, again, it was, it was the best time of my life, but there's no way I'm doing it again. Not a chance. <laughs> I don't know. I go back and forth. I, I, we had two, and I go back and forth. There's, I definitely wish I would have had more. Well, how old are you? 46. Oh, you got a lot of time. You can do another one, yeah. yeah well, I don't think my wife would agree with you. <laughs> uh, it's so funny. Yeah, kids are great. Yeah, yeah my youngest is a, is a fireman. I can't believe it. It's just that's five okay. seconds till. Oh, that's great. Yeah, cool. Yeah, the GM here is something. All right. All right. Now it's now it's official. This show is on. Nice. <laughs> and even cooler, we're streaming the LinkedIn for the first time ever. Oh, is it working? Okay, cool. It's working. So you, you stream also to Facebook and the LinkedIn simultaneously? And YouTube. And YouTube. It's you, man. Look, that's fantastic. Yeah, we, we tried around with uh doing Clubhouse too, and that was uh <laughs> that that didn't work out so well. It is still that alive. seems to be dying off, anyways. It yeah. seems to be dying off. Yeah, it's I was like, get, um, I, I would get like ten alerts a day for Clubhouse crap mm-hmm. that was going on. Now, now I, I think I might get one in the morning, two or three days a week, and that's it. So I was like, yeah, that I shit died off. Yeah, I just tired of it. What's funny is like it, it, it was like digital dealer every day of the week. It's like it was like the vendor fest. <laughs> yeah, nine thousand vendors, and then a dealer would pop in for like ten seconds and leave. The only vendors that stayed were like those that were like sponsored or paid to stay on or wanted to talk about mm-hmm. somebody's product. Everything else was like a vendor fest. It was cool. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was <laughs> that was fun, right? When it first came out, you're right. It was, it was real. Yeah, and I, I think. That, um, uh, you know, as 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 people sort of ideated and shared their ideas and their messaging, I, I think it just it was good at the beginning, and then there was really nothing left to really sustain it. You know, and it's uh, it became much much more of a, a vendor fest. And it was fun, but I don't know that uh, after the first couple of months, dealers were getting much benefit from it. I could be wrong, but it seemed to fade away, like you said. And uh, we're on to the next thing. That's well, how we work. Uh, dealer refresh hangs around another fifteen years. <laughs> yeah. we, we've seen a few things come and go. Um, God, but, I'm gonna think about that. <laughs> it's like your, it's like your fourth kid. 
<laughs> for sure. Well, well, I was talking about Jeff's fourth kid. You know, the, the next oh, one yeah. he's about to have you know, another 15 years. <laughs> right. um, yes, Ryan, Clubhouse might be on its way out. <laughs> Didn't yeah, someone so, start a uh, a competition for that? Who was it? Spotify? No, it couldn't have been Spotify. Someone just maybe it was Spotify. A competition. Someone just has for Clubhouse. Like how big you're what, like how big you're immediately? Yeah, I, I don't know why I'm thinking it was Spotify. That wouldn't make sense. But there's a someone just dropped a huge. Uh, feature within something that's already existing to compete with clubhouse interesting hmm. i know okay. maybe someone thing will I know chat in and apple released the lossless library to their uh their music product oh, and then Amazon you and came you and, and you and your lossless music <laughs> i do like some high quality audio <laughs> I, say. I think i've signed up with like three or four different lossless music programs because of you <laughs> <laughs> So Ryan, man, thanks for joining us, man. It's been a long time, so it's it's great to see you. Um, yeah, it has been a long time. Huh? Yeah, many many years. Uh, mm -hmm. For for the people that don't know who you are, give us a little bit of background. What got you into the industry? Where have you been? Uh, always uh, reference back to, guy, how long ago was that? The Ron's map. It was sort yeah, of. Right. Uh, it was, I guess it was almost like a Google map per se, with with cars listed. Uh, it was yeah. it was pretty unique idea, and basically it was before its time. Yeah, it, it is. And um, by the way, thanks thanks guys for having me on the show. It's, it's a, a lot of fun to connect with you guys. Um, let me answer your first question. Gosh, how did I get started? Here's what's funny: is um, I came out of EDA, Electronic Design Automation, and uh, years ago when I was much much younger, twenty seven years ago, uh, I sold this software to help. Uh, actually, it's funny, we're struggling through this chip crisis, right? Uh, and I worked for companies that designed microprocessors and I sold pro my software that sort of developed these microprocessors. And I got headhunted away by this company who wanted me to work for Nugent Results. And, and uh, I, I'll never forget, I, I sort of interviewed with this guy at a hotel in Sacramento and uh, I thought I was doing well for myself. And um, he wanted me to sell help with the software that sold service reminders based on time and mileage to customers that had you know vehicles, I'm like, you want me to get in the car business, really? And uh, <laughs> that interview kind of went, almost it was almost it almost fell apart. And then he showed me how much money he wanted to pay me. I'm like, I'll, I'll work tomorrow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, that's how I got in industry like 27 years ago. And then since then, um, obviously, I worked for Nutri Results. I really started in the, the fixed ops world, and then uh, ADP. Uh, worked for ADP for about 10 years, uh, national accounts, uh, director of national accounts and front end solutions, uh, things like CRM tools, desking tools. When, um, when online credit processing came out, we did that. Uh, and then that really, um, Jeff, to your point, after that experience uh, was Ron's map. And what was interesting is Ron's map came about because uh, at the time when, when I was selling a lot of paid search, um, dealers always wanted to be in position number one, among other things, right? They wanted a lot of conversion, they wanted traffic, they wanted their phones to ring, and they wanted to be in position number one on search engines. And I thought about that, that, that there's so many stores in a given market and everybody wanted to be at position one. And so it occurred to me that if we just put it on a map, right, and we made everybody position one, that would work out well. Uh, and, and you know, you're, you're right, Jeff, it was, it was uh, uh, a little bit before our time, we raised money, we developed a product. As a matter of fact, at one point, uh, there's a YouTube video that's still out there, but at one point we had more inventory on Ron's map uh, than AutoTrader and Cars.com combined, right? So we just oh, wow. had this, yeah, we had a way to um, uh, use inferential logic and collect a lot of data and we had a lot more inventory. The challenge was, um, I won't mention the, the uh, investor's name, but after we had developed the product, we spent all this money building it. Um, I said to this investor, actually, they asked us, they're like, how do you intend to compete with, you know, auto trader at, that, at the time that was spending tens of thousands of dollars a week, right? Just to promote their, their, uh, their site, uh, in terms of traditional media. And I said, you know, we're going to use social media. We'll use Facebook. We'll use Twitter. We'll use LinkedIn and people <laughs> will share. And they looked at me like I was crazy. Right. And so they didn't want to fund it. And yeah, ultimately, eye in your head, man. Yeah, we couldn't market it, and and literally it went away. And now today I look back, and sometimes I see that guy 
uh, at different digital dealers. I won't mention his name. And he actually chuckles as well. It's like, yeah, you think you had you wanted something wrong. So actually we might. Here, here's a here's a here's a uh, here's a peek. We may come back with another version of that in about uh, six months or so. We're, we're actually toying around with some some strategies that might make that platform a whole lot better, particularly with social media and that kind of thing. But anyway, so that was Ron's map. Um, a, a stint with uh, tier 10 and Velocity, selling a whole lot of paid search uh, and direct mail, of course, and then a short stint with uh, E-Lead, doing the same there. And then we started, you know, Pure Influencer, I think in, uh, I think I know, in 2013, started Pure Influencer and here we are today. It's just, uh, Gangbusters was having a lot of fun, 700 plus clients and we're growing. So. That's that's sort of the, awesome. the one, one minute version of, of my background. <laughs> I didn't realize uh, you had started Pure Influencer back in uh, 13. I didn't realize you, that had been around that long. That's great. Yeah, you know, what's funny is I, I was sitting on an airplane. I was heading to uh, a store in, in New York and I just said to myself, you know what, I'm not ready to retire. And certainly I wasn't I, was, I wasn't tired of traveling. I did that for my entire career. I loved dealers. Uh, some of my best friends today are you know people that I met in the industry, particularly dealers. Uh, but I just said, you know, I'm done. I'm going to go start a little boutique marketing agency, do some specific paid search and digital marketing for just a handful of clients, just my buddies, right? That's what I was going to do. Um, and I was hoping for maybe five or 10 clients max. And here we are 700 stores later. And uh, so that plan didn't work out. Well. <laughs> I guess that's all right. Yeah. So what do you want to talk about? Oh, God. Alex, I thought you had a question. It looked like you were gearing up. Well, more of a comment. When you said you were you were trying to limit your client count and probably the uh, the headaches that that come with hitting a certain number of dealers, you got me thinking about my old boss who always, you know, he he sold dealer dot com and and then ran things that did some stuff at Dealer Track and Cox after those acquisitions. But he would always say, "Man, if I could just do the thirty 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 company, so no more than thirty million dollars in revenue, no more than thirty employees, and." No more than thirty hours a week. That would be the dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When when uh, when we started this company, we 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 had the same idea. We uh we're uh, me specifically. I'm a completely no stuff kind of guy. Like no stuff. I consider stuff to be like hardware, desks, um, things you have to ship to a client, software you have to update, employees, even customers. That's stuff, right? And so in our company, um, we sort of walk the walk. We use AI a lot to do sort of the work that we would naturally hire someone else to do so that we can be almost no stuff. So we try to keep our head count very small. Um, I'm always happy to reduce it uh, as well as, you know, as long as we're growing and profitability is growing, that kind of thing. But yeah, we're a no stuff model. Love it. Um, man, I can't remember all the HR issues. I, I oh goodness. It's like you, you go to this company and you, you think you want, you know, you think you want a hundred employees and you end up with 300 nightmares of HR issues. So, um, but then again, there are a lot of companies that you know, have large volume employees and they do great. That's not for us. Yeah. So you've been in, uh, the, this, I guess the, the digital marketing sector of, of the automotive business for quite some time. What are some of the biggest changes you've seen maybe in the past couple of years? Uh, maybe some things that at one point, uh, you felt as if was, uh, you know, a great decision for dealerships to do uh to maybe dabble into and now as things have changed maybe it's because of COVID and all that good stuff but what are some of the big things you've you've sort of seen where the landscape is really repositioning itself hmm i think that the, the obvious one is digital retailer right um so many stores you know when i left um digital dealer last week i heard so many of the dealers that were there and there weren't many um but uh, it's sort of parody in the landscape right uh Pretty much every store either has digital retailing or is planning to implement a digital retailing uh, platform. Um, and I, th I think that's a big change that we all anticipated coming, uh, but it just so happened so rapidly because of COVID. And um, it's interesting, you know, uh, to see what's going to happen with digital retailing. Here's why. When I ask a dealer about their digital retailing tool, regardless of what vendor it is, um, I asked them if they'd like to decrease the abandonment rate, right? The abandonment rate is those, those shoppers that get on a digital retailing tool and they don't go from A to Z, right? Do they even and know what the abandonment rate is? <laughs> many don't, many don't, you're right, many don't. 
and uh, the vendors do, right? The vend actually, the, the vendors that actually deploy these tools. And roughly the abandonment rate, as you guys know, is somewhere in the 90%, right? And so I ask a dealer, here, here's a scenario. High so, listen, 90s. High 90s. But here's a challenge, Alex. When you ask a dealer or a general manager, would you like to reduce the abandonment rate? The, the abandonment rate? The answer is invariably yes, right? They would, they would like more customers to use it. And so I asked a couple of, a couple of dealers once, I said, what if you could have 100% utilization from a, a visitor who lands on your website, they find ultimately throughout their shopping journey, they find the vehicle they want, and they go 100% of the way from A to Z using your digital retailing tool. I asked them, I said, would that be a good thing? And they, they're like, yeah, that would be perfect. And then I say, did you tell that to the guys who are at the desk, sales managers who make 200 grand a year, did you tell them that you want a tool that eliminates their role? Have you had that discussion, <laughs> right? Because right, the, greater, the greater utilization out of digital retailing, the less you need that person behind the desk, right? So have you had that discussion with Joey or Susie who makes 200 grand that you're like trying to use a tool to ultimately get rid of their role? How'd that discussion go? That's, that's one of my favorite questions. And it, it uh, mixed, mixed reviews. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you still need somebody there who, you know, I don't know if it's worth 200 grand a year, but somebody's got to be there to answer that. Hey boss, I got a customer. What right. do I do now? Oh, well, yeah. did you put him in the CRM? Did you, yeah. you know, yeah. And Alex, you're right. Do, is it worth 200 grand a year? It may be so, right? Because um, I, I tend to think from my experience working with sales managers across the desk, um, their skill set isn't the good ones. Their skill set isn't necessarily what they can do in terms of desking a deal, but what they can do with leading, guiding and directing their people. Right. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of sales managers turn an average salesperson into an absolute rock star because um, that sales manager is invested in that salesperson's future. And I've seen that work real well. Um, and I think that's worth a lot more than 200 grand a year, right? And if you, if you have those type of leaders that are happy to open, unlock the store and lock the store at night, uh, go bell to bell and still invest time in, in people, growing their, growing their salespeople, making sure their customers are, are happy. I think those guys are worth all the money in the world and, and uh, they don't get enough credit in the industry. More often than not, we give credit to a dealer principal or a general manager, but those managers that are behind the desk, really leading and guiding and directing their salespeople, m most often they don't get get the recognition uh, that they deserve. For. So here's 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 from me. Props to you guys. Not keep knocking it out of the park. Well, that's the difference between a sales manager and a desk manager. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Nothing more invaluable than than a than a solid actual sales manager. Um, working with all the dealerships that you work with in in digital retailing because of course that's always a hot topic. Um, what are some of the uh, obstacles that you see most dealerships fail at? Uh, you know, wh where's, where are they really dropping the ball with it? Oh man. Um, Spending too much on us. And, and, that, and that could be, you know, a process at the dealership or even from a technology standpoint. You, you know, uh, Jeff, I think it's introspection. I think that um, if I were to point to a failure point, uh, and there aren't many with dealers and general managers, right? We're talking about some of the most resilient and resilient and creative business managers and business owners in the world are car dealers. You, you know that. Um, and if this isn't shameless pandering to them. This is, I think people outside of our industry would agree that dealers are very creative. They're very resilient and they can do a lot of things. Um, if I had to point to something that I think dealers could do more of, it's introspection. It's looking at what's happening in your showroom in an honest perspective, looking at what's happening with yourself, Mr. Dealer, in an honest perspective. What, I, what do I mean by that? Um, here's one, digital marketing, right? So a dealer oftentimes will say, hey, you know what? I, I made this investment, $10,000, $20,000 a month, whatever the case might be, in a digital marketing strategy, and my return on investment is X. My point would be, how do you know that that's your return on investment? You, you really can't have, from a marketing perspective, you really can't have a return on investment in anything unless you absolutely know what happens in the absence of that investment, right? So Mr. Dealer, are you willing to do some introspection? Are you willing to turn that thing off, whatever that might be, whether it's paid search, social media, whatever, are you willing to turn that off and identify 
what happens in the absence of that investment so that you can determine whether or not you want to execute that investment. And I think that's where most dealers um, aren't focused, but I think if they did focus in that area, um, they would be much better served, much more profitable. So many dealers uh, tell me today, you know, they, again, I spent X, uh, I sold X number of vehicles or I made X profit. And I go, oh, Ron, just that, uh -oh. that email notification. That email came in. And, uh, <laughs> man, that must he needs a stronger CPU. <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm sure he will jump back in. kind of priceless too. <laughs> That could be a meme. <laughs> oh, yeah, hopefully Ron gets back. Although, um, so Jeff, you know, the um, article that he wrote about SEM, mm -hmm. that was, uh, it was fairly intriguing. Yeah, I, I wish I had read it a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. I guess he brings up a lot of stink around this because I, I don't I don't want to label him as sort of the anti anti SEM guy, um, but I think he's sort of got that label across the industry with some people. So I hope he jumps back on so we can uh, <laughs> dive <laughs> really into that. Into that, why everyone's here? <laughs> yeah, there I'll was uh, there was here. something kind of interesting in there that stuck out for me. So when you said let's have Ron on, you showed me that article. The um, mm -hmm. The part of it that that was interesting was when you look at a multi-year viewpoint. Oh, it looks like Ron's coming back in. So, oh, okay, perfect. It's getting ready to text. Him. Let's see. There we go. And now we got two of them. What? Yeah, let's see if we can get rid of that I'll Ron. And then Ron, you're. Uh, it sounds like you're muted. No voice. I see, you. I can't hear you. Not yet. This is that point where you can start talking crap about him and he can't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> Sign language. <laughs> you may have to. Hmm. I'll text him here. All right. Well, anyway. All right. So Ron's coming back in in a minute. But getting back to it, there was an article he wrote in February of 2019. It was on the Pure Influencer blog. And I believe we put it in the, uh, the show notes here. And. One of the things he was saying is when you look at a, a three-year window on your paid search, you don't see a lot of, uh, a lot of change, even though you might be uh, changing your budget significantly. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. We're good. Can you hear me now? We hear you now. Yes. Man, that, 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 that <laughs> 10 minutes of dissertation, you got lost that whole thing. It was cool. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you rambling? <laughs> Yeah, I was patting myself on the back. I'm like, Ron, that was the best ever. <laughs> Sorry, we missed it. You want to back up and maybe uh, give it another no. shot? Where, where, did I, where did I lose you? We were talking about digital retailing, and then when we lost you, we started to switch the subject over to SEM. Okay. So if so you're with, ready with, to... With, yeah, Bill Vaughn has a question, and he says, what have you replaced your SEM spend with, Right. And that's another question I get off, it, often is when I talk to dealers about reducing their marketing spend or reducing their paid search, oftentimes they say, well, what else, what, what should I do in its stead? I'm like, nothing, no, nothing, right? It's like, how about focus on your people? How about focus on your process? How about focus on your facilities? You can do those kinds of things. You don't necessarily have to take money away from paid search and to do something else. Here, here, here's the rub, guys. Check this out. So... The average dealership today across the country has 8,500 monthly unique visitors, right? So let's just use just simple math. Let's just say it's 10,000 monthly unique visitors. If we're to believe Google, and I do, by the way, I'm a big fan of Google. Um, if we are to believe them, nearly 30 to 35% of that traffic is non-human traffic, it's bot traffic. Okay, so let's just use another number. That means 7,000 monthly unique visitors are visiting your website. We know that a third of them at least are there for service, right? So now we're down to about 4,500 monthly unique visitors, humans in your market. You have 4,000 plus people on your website that are looking to buy a car. And for some reason in the world, do you think you need more traffic? 
right? I mean, you get 4,000 visitors organically. Um, it, it's a simple Google uh, Google Analytics login, and you can see that, that your organic traffic and your direct traffic amounts to about 90% of all of your traffic. Your paid traffic, which we can prove most, most just cannibalizes your organic traffic, but if anything, your paid traffic is about nine to ten percent of all your traffic. But you already have four thousand monthly unique visitors for free. What makes you think you need more visitors? What what data point do you have from anywhere in your store that says the reason I'm not successful as a dealer is because I don't have enough monthly unique visitors on my website? There's an, there's a store that can that can confidently point to a data point that says I need more traffic. Right, you don't. Well, let's you, back. You need yeah, let's back. Sorry, let's let's back up here a little bit because we sort of jumped into the SEM part real quick. Um, from what I gather, and and you know, just going through some of the different things, I, I sort of took notice that, you, and I didn't realize this. You're sort of like the anti uh, paid search guy, you, and, and I don't think that's probably a, a fair assessment. Um, but just reading the articles and I had a lot of people reach out to me and there's like, oh man, I'm going to be excited to see this, uh, today because, you know, they either agree or totally don't agree. Uh, I even had a few SEM vendors reach out and, uh, they're, you know, had a few, a few things to say. So they're excited to, but what, what brought that about? What, what happened? Because you used to do a lot of paid search services for dealerships. Like what happened where you're just like, all right, this, this isn't necessarily the right decision. Good question. Well, number one, AdWords certified, right? Number two, I, I think, and um, I've yet to find anybody. I think you saw a couple of posts on LinkedIn a, a few years ago. I haven't yet found anybody who would, would disagree that I haven't sold more paid search as an individual in this industry than some, I, I just sold a ton of paid search. Matter of fact, I was selling paid search with Alta Vista and Yahoo before Google came on board, right? Um, so I sold, I sold a ton of it. Here's what happened. Uh, when we started Pure Influencer, we, we were doing direct mail, email, and targeted display campaigns, right? So we would send 10,000, 15,000 piece mailers coupled with an email campaign and targeted display. And we did that for dealers often. And, and like other vendors, we had to do that. And then we did matchback reportings, right? So every month at the end of the month, we would do a matchback reporting that said, hey, Mr. Dealer, here's all the people that we sent a campaign to. And here's all the people that bought a car or serviced a car. And here's your ROI. And, and of course, hey, let's do it again next month, right? And so, the, you know, so not only we're trying to prove our ROI, but we're trying to win another campaign for the sub subsequent month. And that's really where our company started. And here's what happened, Jeff. One day um, I was on a vacation and my partner called me and he said, hey, man, um, for one of our clients, a, a huge Mercedes dealership in Minnesota, he said, hey, man, um, bad news. <laughs> he said, uh, we didn't we didn't do our email campaign or our targeted display campaign. And I'm like, all right, no, no problem. Call the dealer. Let's let's reimburse him or we'll give him a credit for the next month. But let's just get get that out and open. And he said, no, no, it's actually worse. <laughs> And I said, what do you mean it's worse? He said, we didn't even do our direct mail. I'm like, wait a minute, we, we oh. dropped the whole ball. We didn't send anything. He's like, nothing. I'm like, well, get on the phone right now. Let's call him, let's have a three-way. Let's explain what happened and let's give him a full credit or return his money. Then this is what happened, Jeff. He said, it's worse than that, Ron. I'm like, okay, well, what can be worse? Did we rock the store or something? And he said, no, we had the best month ever in terms of a matchback report ever of the people that we were going to send a campaign to the vast majority of them bought and we didn't even eat, didn't execute the campaign. And I said, that's terrible. Um, that's really bad news. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Right. And, and as a, at the time I was a massive paid search advocate and I'm like, that can't be true. And so fortunately for us, this, this store is a good partner of ours. They're still our clients today. They were willing to do that the next month and the subsequent month. And in each of those cases, we grabbed the data set of people that were in the market, right? These were the people that we were going to market to. We chose not to market to them. And in each case, the store did well. Then I said, okay, that's just one store. Um, I'm not sold. 
And my partner then actually picked up a store in Seattle. We had one in LA and another store in Texas that we that were willing to join this experiment with us. And for 90 days, those stores, we pretended to execute campaigns and the ROIs were the same, if not better than had we ran campaigns. So what, what occurred to me then that unfortunately, and I apologize a lot all the time for it, that didn't occur to me through the first you know, 18 years that I was doing this kind of stuff was what we were looking at in terms of the data, Google Analytics data, CRM data, what we were looking at was merely correlation, not causation. We were executing campaigns and the market was buying cars anyway. And we correlated our campaign with what they were doing. And then we built tools to make sure we knew what the heck we were talking about, right? So for example, we have in our company today, we have, we have tools that actually can analyze and, and show a dealer the difference between true causation and cannibalization. Um, another thing that led, led me to that sort of uh, awareness was that uh, from a digital marketing campaign, by the way, I, I'm a huge fan of, of paid search, massive. If I owned, if, if I've owned a floral shop or a pizza shop, or if I had a buy here, pay here store, paid search would be the first thing I do. But if I owned a retail auto dealership, I, I, I get more organic traffic just because of my brand and my location. I can take those dollars and redirect those dollars internally and have a greater impact than I could by driving another eight or four or 5% more traffic than I'm going to get anyway on my website. So these stores that were, were having the same results, regardless of the spend, um, they have good real estate. Yes, sir. Were they, uh, were they brands with a lot of competition in that market? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I assume they've been in business for a while. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so they had some presence. They were known in the market. Mm -hmm. Uh, their websites mm -hmm. probably had some organic traffic going to it. Like you said, um, mm -hmm. so if you're a dealer outside of that market and you're trying to pull customers from that marketplace, so let's say you're, you're outside of Chicago and you're trying to pull people from Chicago out to your, your dealership, maybe you're a new point. That'd be okay. a good time to use paid search, right? Well, well let, let's explore that. Right. So, um, if you're a new point, let, let's take that example. You're, you're, you're a new point and you are 60 miles, 80 miles, 100 miles outside of Chicago. And you want to pull, and maybe you're just 20 miles outside of Chicago, and you want to pull traffic from that metro. Okay, well, let's, let's look at not what you can do from a digital marketing or an ad, digital advertising strategy. Let's look at first how people shop. Let's consider that first. So let's, say, let's just pick a brand. Let's say you're a new Honda Point, right? You're a new Honda Point, didn't exist before and you want to win Honda buyers in your market. Google tells us, or Cox Automotive tells us, or Dealer On, or all the people that have done all these online studies, that the average shopper spends about 18 hours online before they buy a vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. 18 hours. Hold that thought for a moment. The reason we, we as dealers spend money with Google, more so than Bing or Yahoo, is supposedly Google has the better search engine, right? Supposedly Google is the best at organically taking a search query and matching it with a search result. Supposedly Google is the best at that. So if they're the best at that organically and somebody spends 18 hours online and they can't find you in their backyard, <laughs> do you really want that shopper in your showroom? Right, I mean, 18 hours and they can't find your store? What, what are they doing? They're not spending 18 hours or they're not spending 17.9 hours on one of your competitor's sites. They're on the OEM site, they're on the U site, they're on Edmund site, they're on Auto Trader, they're on third party. They're everywhere. And in, in that time, they're going to find your store whether you like it or not. Jeff, you were talking about reviews and you were talking about in your store, you love that you get a lot of quality reviews, right? Um, of all the reviews you've ever had, you, you've probably had reviews, I'm talking about negative reviews. You've probably had negative reviews, people talking about any individual sales manager or salesperson, or maybe the service experience or F and I would have, you've all had those, you've had those reviews. I would be willing to bet you've never had one review that it sounded like this. The car was great. 
The experience was great. The salesperson was wonderful. Everything was just great. The only problem was I had a difficult time finding that store online. Right? It, it's just it's nonsense. No, we're trying to solve a problem with digital marketing that does not exist. No one complains about not being able to find your website. No one does. It's a ruse. It's it's a big lie. <laughs> no one. <laughs> the big lie. Not, No, we've never had a review like that. That's for sure. Have you ever had somebody say, I couldn't find you online ever? No, no, no. no. There's, nobody, no. there's nobody at the Father's Day picnic with a brand new, um, probably not new because of COVID, uh, the, the chip crisis, but there's nobody who rolls up with a new Tacoma talking to their friends and showing off to their Tacoma and they say, hey, did you buy it from the Toyota store around, around the corner from your house? And the guy goes, really? There's a Toyota store there? I had no idea. I mean, that doesn't happen, right? They, our customers know where we are. They find us. The OEM tells them where we are. Um, Google says, I mean, the moment you begin to type, right, doesn't it say Honda dealers near me, right? Um, mm -hmm. This nonsense about um, long-term, long-tail searches, uh, the person who's looking for a red Toyota Tacoma with leather interior nav, and they put that in a search term, that's just not true. The people that do that are the vendors that do it. The vendor does that and then later shows you in Google <laughs> Analytics that someone searched for that. It's just not true. Yeah, you typically find that, that used car on a third party site. I'm sorry? Am I, apparently I'm having some mic issues, but apparently most people I know find the used car on a third party site and then go to yeah. the dealership website from there. Here, here's the dichotomy. Thank you for bringing used cars up, right? Um, there's evidence that dealers know themselves, their own behavior says they don't need paid search. Let me prove it to you. We dealers, we all use V auto first look AX, et cetera, some inventory management tool, right? And we use those tools obviously prior to the uh, inventory crunch, but we use those tools to make sure that a similar make model mileage, feature and trim vehicle is priced according to the market, right? And the reason a dealer is willing to spend that money on a tool is because the dealer says to himself or herself, I want to make sure that my car is priced correctly so that when the shopper looks at the other cars, they see that my price is in line. Wait a minute, pause. You believe the shopper visits multiple dealer websites for used. Why do you disbelieve that to be true with for new? Right. I mean, your own behavior tells you that people are comparing you to other stores. So why in the world do you need to use paid search to cause them to do it? It doesn't work. Right. I, I, not that it doesn't work. It doesn't work in retail auto the way most dealers and general managers believe it does or expect it to. Right. So, yes, paid search works beautifully. Um, but in our industry, it doesn't work the way most general managers or dealer principals are led to believe. Um, Alex, I ask people about amplification and lift all the time. And they look at me like the deer stuck in head like, that. what are you talking about? I said, amplification occurs when paid search is working, you will see an amplification of organic and direct visits. Why? Because no one lands on your website for the first time from any paid search strategy, lands on your website, sees your Toyota Tacoma, yells across the house to their wife and says, honey, honey, I found one. Grab your purse. We're running down there and go buy it. That's not how it happens, right? They find your car. We wish. And then, what, and then what do they do? They go to Google and say, where else in town can I find that vehicle to compare availability features and price, right? That's what they do. They did it before Google. They visited five, six, seven stores physically. And now with Google, they do it so much easier. So that's how people shop. And anybody who tells you that's not how people shop, does not have your best interest in mind. People compare your vehicle to all the other same brand vehicles in the market. People will find that 2012 Subaru that you have in the back of the lot on your website and they'll find it on other websites because Google works organically. Google has this crazy dichotomy because on one hand they say, hey, organically we can surface up anything you search for. But yet at the same time, they're like, well, Mr. Dealer, you need to pay us if you want somebody to find that vehicle. It's just nonsense. It just doesn't, doesn't compute. Do the price comparison tools, then it's just got me thinking about, you know, because it's just natural that we do that. It's just, it's instinct or, or I should say maybe just a learned habit 
that we do want to price compare. We do want to go to the other sites and see where's, where does this call car fall in line um, up against competition. Does it make sense to have something on your VDP that would sort of help diffuse that? Or do you think the customer is going to do that no matter what? And what I mean by that is like some type of, of price comparison. We've all seen the plugins out there way back in the day. You don't see them very much anymore, uh, but you could actually, um, and then of course there's a couple of other retail sites out there that will show you, okay, here's our price, but here's, you know, five other companies that have this and here's their price. And sometimes mm -hmm. they're not always the best price, the lowest or the highest. Um, but I've seen in the past, there's been tools where you could actually put inventory from other dealerships show up on that VDP and showing where your vehicle falls in line. Maybe it's not as descriptive. Maybe there's not a photo included, but it'll give, you know, there's five other vehicles just like this one in the market. And this is where yours fits in with yeah. that. And I know I'm sort of going off base here a little bit, but I just have my Did wheels turning because I remember seeing those tools. Yeah. Did you just make a plug for our enhanced VDP product? Because uh, we do that. No, right? I didn't um, know you had that. I swear. Yeah. <laughs> so, so for example, let's talk about, let's talk about inventory management, right? The reason Susie, the used car manager, the reason she gets in in the morning at eight o'clock, uh, she's got her coffee in hand and she logs into, let's say V auto and she makes price changes based on what V auto confirms her to do, right? That's her job. Mm -hmm. So we built a tool. I'm not going to plug it too much here, but we built a tool that just does that automatically, right? It looks at all the other prices in the market and then it changes prices based on your rules. What would you do? Do you want to be 5% higher than that competitor or 5% lower, what have you? And then we displayed those prices on a VDP. Again, we don't do that much for a lot of stores today for a, a, a particular reason. I'll get into that later. Um, but what's cool about your idea, Jeff, and, and that discussion is that's the ultimate form of transparency, right? And when, and today, I, I think we touched on this earlier. Another thing that dealers could do today is help to change the, the paradigm that, that customers distrust us. Today, what dealers could do to spend money is do things that make customers trust you more. It, it's laughable when somebody says, hey, yes. I'm all about transparency. And then you get to their VDP and you have to unlock their price. I'm like, what's transparent about that? Right? <laughs> I mean, there's nothing transparent about I have to unlock. And then what's worse is I can I can change everything from uh, the, the price of my car to my monthly payment, all those sorts of things, but I can't adjust the price of your car. There's nothing transparent about that, right? You're just telling me this is the price and I got to take it. Um, so yes, anything that you can do on your VDP, on your website and in your showroom that engenders more trust, that 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 opens up, so to speak, um, what's happening in, in, in the pricing of your vehicle, I, I think stores will win. And that's that's time and money better spent than trying to drive traffic to your website when you not only have more traffic than you, can, than you know what to do with, but those shoppers are getting to your website anyway. There, there's no data that shows you that they're not. You know what I mean? So you're definitely hitting on something. And apologies if I'm coming through too loud now. Um, uh, you fixed it. Is that better, Jeff? Yeah, All good. A little better. All right, good. So, you know, there's a a number of dealers that are starting to bitch about Vroom and Carvana. And mm -hmm. those are two very transparent things. They're also more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, I love your idea of working on being more trustful. I don't think dealers understand the messaging that they're putting out there and where the customer is getting hung up and, and feeling like, oh my God, these guys are dishonest. Yeah, the lead gate, that's a big one putting up a wall before you can get a price. Um, but mm -hmm. some of the other ones is dealers don't realize that they've got multiple payment calculators in their website or multiple mm -hmm. digital retailing tools. They're all saying mm -hmm. something different or the manufacturer too. They, they've got a lot of blame in this as well because they're going to show a different payment in the manufacturer website. They're going to advertise mm -hmm. a different payment too. So when mm -hmm. you go in and build your car, build your truck, you're not going to, you're not always going to see like the two ninety nine special vehicle because you built it just a little bit differently or whatever it is. It's just hard to get there and you end up at an $800 payment because it's all based on sticker price. Um, right. And then you go to the dealer site and there's a payment calculator, the, the age old payment calculator that you have from, 
you know, your standard dealer inspired dealer.com website, you should turn that off if you're going to have a digital retailing solution because sure. that thing's baked in with some APR that's usually like mm -hmm. eight or nine percent. Mm -hmm. And then somebody sees that they think you're, you're being truthful with them. You're showing them something. You're going to see a payment that's too high. They're going to yeah. bail. And the, yeah. or if you're lucky, they go into the, the digital retailing tool, which gets abandoned at 96% or more. Um, mm -hmm. And they might not get all the way down to the payment. Right. Yeah. And so, you, you're right. And, and particularly, you know, if you look at from a payment strategy, um, if you want to hold the most gross, the stores that I see that are, and again, this is pre inventory crunch right now, everybody's holding a lot of gross, but I'm talking about the sort of normal if we can talk about that for a moment um the stores that that i see that are most successful to your point alex are those that are working to be more trustworthy if you have let, let's take a look at um let's talk we're, we're beating up on toyota tacoma so let's beat up on honda civics let's say you have the best price in the market in your market you have the best price uh or, or even if the consumer was to look at it let's say you have the lowest price for example the only thing that causes the consumer to do is shop your competition, right? They have to verify that that is the best price. So for example, here's another silly thing that dealers do a lot and no offense to those dealers that still do it. But when you have best price on your website, let's dissect that for a moment on your VDP. So first of all, we're, we're talking to an audience that doesn't trust us already, right? Mm -hmm. The auto buyer does not trust us. They get to a VDP and they see the word best price. There's only one way a human can appreciate if that is the best price. And what is that? It is to compare that price to the other prices under the market, right? So when you put the word best price, you're actually, you're actually causing that shopper to go compare you to other stores, right? And so again, it, it, I hearken back to the fact that so many digital marketers know so much about marketing, but so little about how people shop in automotive retail. And if we could just be honest about how people shop in automotive retail, then we could save dealers tens of thousands of dollars a month where they can redirect that to either people process or hip national, right? Right in their pocket and make themselves more profitable. It's time for the digital marketing industry to be honest with dealers about how people shop and if you can't do that then go study how people shop because nobody clicks on a paid ad unit lands on a dealer's website goes to a vdp jumps in a digital retailing carousel and buys a car <laughs> that does not happen unless they've been what? on your site six times, unless they've been on your site six or seven times in the last 60 days but it, there's no ad unit but here let's have some fun it's called paid search Let's think about that. You're paying for a click for someone in your market who wants to find the car that you have on your website. They, they're they're going to find it organically. You, it's like paying. It's like hiring somebody to open a showroom door after someone's taken a demo, and then that person gets all the credit for selling cars. Right? I, I opened the door. They came in, so I want some credit. That's that's what a paid ad unit is in retail auto. The consumer said, I need a new car. Some stimulus happened. Uh, I have a new job, I'm, I, whatever, my car wrecked, whatever. I, whatever, I need a new car. The consumer said, I need a new car. They have two expediency devices, right? Expediency device number one is their mobile phone, right? Expediency. Expediency device number two is a search engine. For this case, Google, right? Mm -hmm. It's just about expediency. I need to find what I'm looking for. I'm already looking for it. I'm not going to buy the first one I land on. It's the second largest purchase I'll ever make. So I'm not going to buy the first one I land on. I'll do some homework. Literally, if we believe Google, it's a 70 day shopping journey and 17 hours online. In those 17 hours, they're going to find you whether you like it or not. And if that human can't find your dealership, in their backyard, I promise you, you don't want that show, that person in your showroom. Can you imagine desking the deal with that person, right? And so it, the ones you want are gonna find you whether you like it or not. The, the key is, can you be, to your point, Alex, transparent online? Can you be more credible online? Can your outbound emails, your outbound phone calls, the talent that you have, the resources that you have in your store, can they be credible and they can be professional? 
that's that's today where the where the stores are winning the most. It's those stores that are investing in. I want to, I want to genuinely be transparent. I want to make my website trivial to use, and I want my salespeople to have the most skill set so that when they communicate to the customer, that customer gets all their questions answered. They feel confident. They trust that person. They want to come to the store and they want to buy a car. So when you're talking about people finding the car organically, you're, you're assuming that the vehicle itself is getting uh, picked up by Google or are you thinking they're going to come through the third party classified sites? I see some confusion and some disagreement in some of the comments. Um, I think that might be where it hasn't been defined yet. And that might be where it's coming from. Yeah. So if you have a piece of inventory on your website that for any reason you, you believe a consumer wouldn't find it organically, right? Whatever that is, then, then the solution for that is search engine optimization. That's the solution. It, it's optimizing that website, optimizing that inventory, making sure that the search queries align with the search term. And by the way, here's another thing that frustrates me. Years ago, um, Google had, in Google Analytics, um, had a, there was a percentage, what's called um, search engine refine or, or search term refinement. So when you had your keywords in those campaigns, there was a percentage that, that Google told us then, the number of times people refined the search that was relevant to the search term we wanted. Let's say it was a, 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 key, a keyword phrase. So let's say it was a Honda Accord. Well, somebody searched for Honda Accord, then they would search Honda Accord near me, then they search Honda Accord four wheel drive or whatever the case, right? And they would refine their search. In other words, and it was dramatic, it was a large number. And Google then took that away. Why is that? Because for, for whatever reason, Google didn't want, to, want us to really realize that people do that. People change their search query. You do it all the time. Everybody listening to this show, you, I don't care if you're looking for a restaurant or a brand new car. Uh, when you search something and you don't get the result you want, you don't give up and go make toast. You just change your search query, right? And so in 17 hours, that's what people do. So if you believe you have a piece of inventory that for some reason isn't gonna be found, that's not a search engine marketing solution. That's a search engine optimization solution. Go find one of those guys and optimize your website correctly. So years ago, back when I was at Checkered Flag, um, our, our high, our, one of our Highline stores was uh, Jaguar, Audi, Porsche, Land Rover. And the general manager of that location at that time, not the current one today, was deeply into V Auto. I mean, if V Auto said do it, he did it. If it said jump off a bridge, he was going to jump off the damn bridge. Um, and V Auto said that he should carry 2007 Honda Odysseys. Um, and so he started picking them up. He picked up a handful, and I think he sold the first one and got all excited. Um, and then they stopped selling. But uh, if, if you're doing something like that, you're a, you're a Jag, Porsche, Audi, Land Rover dealer and trying to carry minivans, um, uh, used minivans. How do you tackle that one then without paid search? Well, again, remember, you, you, you have to first agree that Google isn't the search engine that they say they are. You, you have to first agree to that. You have to say, you know what? Google does not have the ability to surface something organically when I search for it, right? And that's a tall order. I, I can't subscribe to that. If you have a piece of inventory on your website, Google's going to find that inventory today and or tonight. There's no argument there. So when someone's looking for that piece of inventory, they're going to find it. Again, it's not 17 minutes online. It's 17 hours. And they're not spending 17 hours looking at just auto trader website. They're not spending 17 hours just looking at your competitor. They're spending 17 hours going through many different search terms, looking at a lot of in inventory. You do not have a single person that is surprised about the inventory you have in your lot if they're looking for it. You don't. You don't have somebody going, oh, I, I had no idea you had that 2009 Subaru there. I don't if know. Those were Porsche customers were pretty uh, surprised about those Honda Odysseys. But anyway. What's that? I said those Porsche customers were pretty surprised about those Honda Odysseys. <laughs> yeah, to see that inventory on their website, right? I tell Somebody asked me years ago, like, Ron, what would you do? Again, to this question about, he said, if you had a Toyota store, what would you do with, you know, Chevrolet inventory and Ford inventory? I'm like, I wouldn't have it. Not a single. 
I'm about, I want to build trust in the market and I want to leverage brand equity from Toyota. I don't care about the dealership or the market knowing my brand. That, there, there's no shopper run, running around like, hey man, that's, that's a, a really unique dealership over there, right? What they say is that's a Toyota dealership or that's a Ford dealership. So that's your brand, own it. And if, if it were me, any off make would be sold on, on, a, on a wholesale market tomorrow morning. I'd be known as the Toyota store, new and used period, right? That, that's what I would do. I would carry no off brand, none. Zero. I would be the Toyota guy and I would own that brand or not own it, but I would leverage that brand equity from Toyota or from Ford. And that would be my store um, because I know people are shopping for Toyotas, right? If you're in a Toyota market, you want to buy from me. I'm the Toyota guy sort of thing. Uh, I'm not the Toyota guy. That's a part-time Ford guy. I'm not the Toyota guy. That's a part-time Mercedes guy. I'm in the Toyota store. That's what I would do. And I, I know that, by the way, there are stores that are actually moving in that direction. And that's kind of cool because now the market can trust you a little bit more. They align the Toyota brand with your store and they see you as a dealership of not trying to be something other than you, you really are. You're just a Toyota franchise. That's the way the market looks at us. And we should embrace that and leverage it. It's, it's, it's a big marketing piece to, hey, I'm, I'm a Toyota dealership. It's, embrace that. Yeah, it's a unique concept. I wasn't too long ago, I was on a Toyota dealership and was wondering why. The reason why, the reason why I got there was because we had acquired a vehicle and I'm like, what dealership? And it was a truck. Uh, I think it was a Dodge truck. And I'm like, why would they get, it was a beautiful truck. I'm like, why would they get rid of this? And I was looking at selling it to a friend. So I started doing some research on it and found out that it was traded in at a Toyota dealership and then they sent it to auction. I'm like, Why the hell would they do that? But then I start going through their inventory. I'm like, they don't have any off makes. Mm -hmm. That was it. All Toyotas, new used. They yeah. did not, you know, there was nothing outside of that. And I was like, oh. man, they're, they're missing out on a lot of money and opportunities. Um, man, that, that'd be a hard one for, for dealerships that's been selling, you know, off make used cars, that'd be a tough one to get them to change. Yeah, it's, it's no doubt. It'd be a tough, if not impossible transition. Um, but the message in the marketplace is strong, right? It, it says, Hey, that, yeah. that is committed to the Toyota brand. That's whom they are. I can trust them when it comes to Yeah. Well, Ron, I can definitely get on board with uh, investing more in things that make you more trustworthy to the consumer. I'm all about that. Um, mm -hmm. That's anything you can do there is going to be a win. Um, there's definitely some audience out there uh, who isn't totally bought in on completely cutting paid search. Um, well, and I was going to ask if, if, if dealership isn't, is there anywhere through all your years of doing this, is there anywhere now that you believe would be a good, uh, a good strategy for paid search with dealerships, you know, and maybe it's, uh, you know, it's because this dealership is located in a particular area or because, um, you know, because they're a new point or because they've already got, uh, a great percentage of market share and now they want to go outside of the market. Is there any areas where you feel as if paid search could play a difference? You know, it was, that is, um, we don't have to use my opinion nor a marketing vendor's opinion nor a dealer's opinion. We don't have to use that to, to answer your question specifically, Jeff, we have data. You have data. Each store has data that can answer that question correctly. The first rule of marketing, and by the way, it, in, in my marketing classes, I would have flunked if I didn't respect the first rule. And the first rule when you're making an investment in marketing is you have to know empirically what happens in the absence of the investment. You, you, you absolutely must know that. You, and, and, and accounting for seasonality and everything else, you have to know what happens in the absence of your investment. So to answer your question, Yes, potentially paid search can work wonders for you. Only if you know, not from your gut or not from your intuition, but from what the data tells you, what happens in the absence of that investment. And here's how simple that is. You can jump into Google Analytics today and you can look at your overall total traffic, right? And let's just say your total traffic, organic, direct, paid, all that traffic. Let's say your total traffic is roughly 10,000 monthly unique visitors per month. Well, if you back down your budget, 
right? Let's say you back it down 20%, 30%, 50%. I'm talking about a paid search budget with Google. If you back it down, then you should see a commensurate drop in total traffic. You should see that. If you back it down and you don't see a drop, and then you choose to spend more money, you're the last person that should be running a dealership, right? Right? And so, yeah. And I'm being serious. So you, you have to say, I choose to believe the data, not my intuition, not my gut, not what all the marketing vendors are telling me. Not, I choose to believe the data. I want to pull, or if, if you think I'm crazy, many of you probably do at this point, then do the inverse, increase the budget, right? You should see a commensurate increase in organic traffic. Why should you see an increase in organic? Because of how people shop. If you use a paid ad unit to bring someone to a website and you're successful and that, that's the right person, they're in market, they're looking for your brand, then you're going to see that person or that visitor organically and or direct again in subsequent visits throughout their journey, right? So you should see a commensurate lift. It's called amplification and lift is what it's called. So when, when paid search really does what you think it does, you should see a commensurate lift in organic tra traffic or drop relative to your spend. So, so don't trust Ron, trust your data. <laughs> All you have to say is, okay, cool. I've got 10,000 monthly unique visitors and I spend 15 grand a month this month or this quarter, I'm gonna spend seven grand. And I'm gonna see if I dramatically lost total traffic. Will you lose paid traffic? Of course you will. Um, will you see a lift in organic traffic? Of course you will because of the cannibalization factor. But what you care about is your total traffic line. It's not that complicated. The reason me as a vendor, when I was selling it, the reason I had to be Google Ad certified, the reason I wanted it so complex, the reason I talked about bounce rates and conversion rates and time on site is I'm telling you the truth, Mr. Dealer. We wanted it to be so confusing to you that you just said, you know what, you do it. But it's not that confusing. Total traffic, that's the one metric. Do you have more or less? And if and if you can confidently back down, confidently back your paid search down, and you don't lose any total traffic, why in the world would you re, would you add that spend back? And again, I'm a huge fan of Google. Uh, I love paid search for what it could potentially do, but the reason the store should do it is if the data says they should do it. And the data is king, right? The data will tell you whether um, you're actually winning. Here's the key. You need to be winning traffic to your website that you would not have or could not have in the absence of paid search, right? The point of it is to win traffic that you could not have or would not have had organically. That's the point. It's not for all the little vanity metrics and all that kind of stuff. That's not the point. Um, here's another one that drives me crazy. I'm looking for an Acura and a Lexus dealer shows up, right? And they, out, they, they bid for that search term, right? Let's back up. We know customers distrust us already. I'm looking for an Acura and you put on the very top link a Lexus. And I click on it and I'm like, oh man, I didn't want to be here. All you're doing is reinforcing the fact that people don't trust us. Stop doing things Generous. that are not trust gendering, right? Build trust, not build traffic. You've got more traffic than you know what to do with. The average store, Jeff, would go out of business, completely out of business, if they sold only 20% of the traffic that they had this month, right? Let's say you got 10,000 monthly unique visitors and let's say you sold a thousand, thousand of those people. You don't have the inventory for next month and the following month. Your, your service drive is out of business. Your salespeople don't have anything to sell. You have more traffic than you know what to do with and mm -hmm. you somehow think you need more. What <laughs> data point exists that says you need more traffic? You don't need well, more I think traffic. It's 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 more about I think what they would say is it's more about getting targeted traffic. So yeah, you can get a lot of traffic to your website, but you know only a percent are going to convert. Uh, only a percentage of them, you know, are going to find exactly what they're looking for. So how can you get a higher targeted amount of traffic? You know, and I'm sure you know paid search would be shown that the, you know it, it, that's an effective way to do so because you can get so descriptive. You can. Uh, you know, go the long tail. Um, mm -hmm. So my guess would be, you know, if I were an SEM vendor, I would focus in on that and try and prove that, okay, maybe we're not increasing 
the traffic by a large amount, but we're increasing the targeted traffic by a percentage, which is going to equate into a higher conversion because they are such a targeted customer. However, also know whenever you go back and you look at your analytics and look at your, your conversion, and we've been told this for years and years, that the organic customer has a higher rate of conversion. And I'm sure maybe yeah. you can reinforce that as well. Dramatically, our, our data with our tools show that dramatically, an order of magnitude of 20 in terms of, in terms of conversion rate and lead to sale, right? And you're right, um, it's the industry average conversion rate is 1.7% in terms of form flow, right? So you drive all this traffic to your website or you hope you drive all this traffic. Let's say there's this traffic that visits your website and only 1.7% of them convert to a form fill. There's another percent that converts obviously to service and phone call, what have you. Um, but again, you could, you could want more conversion. You could, but I mean, let's be honest. Let's just, let's just back up. Let's say Jeff, you and I went in the store this weekend, right? Of all the deal jackets of deals that didn't get closed, if we grabbed all the last two weeks of deal jackets of didn't, uh, that didn't get closed between you and I and a few phone calls. Do you think we'd find another deal or two? Oh, for sure. We, right. Okay. So, so that's one point. In the service drive, vehicle exchange, if you and I were to actively go work a vehicle exchange process for just a week, do you think we would find more deals than we typically would if we didn't do that? Obviously we would, right? If but you, Brian, it's so, much, you, it's so much easier just to get more traffic. <laughs> yeah, it, well, wait, wait, because uh, I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. It, Mr. Dealer, if you went into this, your CRM tool today and you looked at all the leads that were marked bad leads and you made those phone calls or I did, do you not believe we'd get more appointments and more sales? Of course we would. So I would tell you, quit running from your job, man. It's not about selling more cars. It's about spilling fewer opportunities. It, and that's why you are a GM. That's why you're a dealer principal. That's why you're a GSM. It's about spilling fewer opportunities. We have so many opportunities. Or how about leading and coaching and guiding a salesperson who has so much upside ambition, but we don't give them enough time. We don't give them enough attention. And then they end up leaving in 90 days and we got to spend time replacing that person. There's so many other things that we can do that make our store more profitable everybody more money and makes the makes your market trust you more when your market trusts you here's what happens at the family picnic they say i bought this toyota from that store man those guys are great it was easy it's almost like being in the, in the apple store when your market trusts you and they're at work and somebody over the cubicle says hey they need a new truck that person stands up and says hey you need to go see my buddy joe at xyz honda store because that guy's great guess those, who they don't shop from carvana they, or vroom they, too Yes. And by the way, Carvana and Vroom, we created that mess, right? As dealers, mm -hmm. we caused sure. it by, by, by creating all this friction in our showroom. We created that. And it, it's, it's laughable to me to hear when I hear dealers say, oh, I'm going to compete with them on a digital marketing standpoint. I'm like, are you kidding? That's not, it's not your digital strategy that had people buying from Carvana. It's the friction you have in your showroom that has people not wanting to be there. And guess what we did then? Here was a genius idea. We learned from all the CSI data that nobody wanted to be in our showroom and do business with us. So we had this genius idea that we put digital retailing tools up so that you can do business <laughs> with us in your bedroom the same way we do business. It just makes sense. Like, no. <laughs> People weren't complaining that you didn't have a digital retailing tool. People were complaining no. that it was better to visit the dentist than to visit you. Fix that. And that's an easy fix. It is. Alex almost got shot. I was at a a couple of digital dealers ago, I asked, uh, I was in, it was in Vegas, two, two, two back, maybe three back. And I was doing this session. And I said, how many, how many GMs are in the room, dealer principals? And a, and a bunch of guys stood up, right? And I said, if you've never sold a car, sit down. And they didn't sit down. I said, so when you were selling cars, your job was to understand the product, understand word tracks on the phone, understand customer, customer, you know, handling objections, et cetera. That was your job. Yes. Okay. And I said, if you've never been a sales manager, sit down. None of them sat down. I said, when you were a sales manager, your job was to understand inventory, understand pricing, lead, lead guide, direct salespeople, hire salespeople. Those were the things that you were focused on. Yeah. Okay. If you've never been a GSM, sit down. A couple of them did. I said, as a GSM, 
your role was obviously new and used inventory, hiring the right managers, all those sort of strategies that happen inside the store. And I said, then you became a GM. I said, where along your journey did you study marketing? You never did. But now, because you've sat as a GM or dealer principal, you've sat in a few demos from marketing vendors, you believe you're a marketer? No, your skill set is what you knew how to do in the showroom. Transfer that skill set. Take that time, that experience that you have and spend that with your people, with your managers. That's where you're most successful. And if you do that, your people will be more successful, your market will trust you more, and you wouldn't need to waste the money on paid search. Right? They'll use your skill set that you've had for 18, 20 years and do that because you didn't have 20 years of marketing study, like maybe I have or other people did. So you're not really the marketer that you think you are. It, it, it's that's not a knock. I don't mean it that way. I, I probably came off wrong. It, you, you have you're better served as a leader in your store than you are as a temporary marketer. That's all I'm saying. That's gotcha. you know that's a and that's a great way to end this show. I think, Ron, yeah, you're preaching that, the right things. Build trust with your customers, and ways you do that is by training your people to do the job better. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and then the marketing will fall in place. For sure, it all falls in place. Yeah. And again, yes. In closing, it, paid search can work, but but make sure you can prove with data what happens in the absence of that investment. Be brave, be smart, and say, you know what, we're gonna prove what happens in the absence of that investment. That way we can genuinely justify the investment when we turn it on. Ron, I'm sure you probably piss a lot of people off today. Um, <laughs> <I know. laughs> Which is always a good thing sometimes, right? You gotta, um, sure, right? You gotta, gotta get you people might. thinking. <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll get a copy of this over in the forums. I'm sure maybe uh, some of the conversation will continue over there. Um, but if anyone wants to get a hold of you, you know, how would they do so? And if you want, what, just give us a quick, um, uh, just a quick insight of what you're doing over there with Pure Influencer. Cool. Uh, first question, if you need to get a hold of me, it's, in, it's easy. Uh, either LinkedIn or Facebook, um, Ron Morrison. Uh, my email address is ronmorrison at pureinfluencer.com. Uh, my phone number, if you want it, is 408-218-6407. 408-218-6407. Here's what we're doing at Pure Influencer. We, we focus exclusively on converting more traffic that you have on your website to first party leads. Matter of fact, all of our clients get minimally 30% more first party leads when they do business with us. Uh, and then we also have two other pieces of technology that rolled out that I'm really excited about. Uh, number one, we have a very unique way to, ma to marry the talent that you have in your showroom with the human visitors that you have on your website, right? So we can let and, and actually bridge them together and create more conversations. So rather than just more leads, more quality conversations with the salespeople that know the product, know sales skills, know your store, et cetera. Um, the one I'm most excited about, you guys could probably guess, is we now have our um, our, our My Analytics So no, you have a paid search tool? Yeah, yeah, yes, it's wildly <laughs> more accurate than Google Analytics and we can prove it. And it's a great tool for a dealer say, to say, hey, I'm going to use this tool so that I can see what happens in the absence of the, my investment. I'm going to use this tool so that I know the truth about what's happening on my website and so that I'm not dependent on a marketing vendor or an internet director. So we've taken all the complexity out of the important things with measuring traffic on your website so that a dealer can pull his pull phone out of his pocket and instantaneously know what organic direct paid traffic is and leads in a very simple, clear concise format that's designed specifically for dealers. That's what we're doing. Beautiful. I like the nice. sound of that, which I, I think I expressed that to you uh, earlier this week. So Ron, it's always yeah, a pleasure. Aren't we, man. Aren't we due for, for a us. demo on that one, Ron? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Aren't we due for a sure. demo on we'll that put one? Put that together. Absolutely. We'll put that together. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Cool. All right, sir. Well, well thanks, happy guys. Father's Day to you two gentlemen. Thanks for letting me get in my soapbox. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no all problem. the people that we pissed off, I apologize. You can call me or email me. Just tell me how crazy I am, and uh, I'll give you guys a shout out on LinkedIn. I, I, many of you are right, uh, and I'm not claiming to be completely right. I'm just saying it's better to trust the data than to trust someone else's opinion. Yeah. No doubt. Well, thank you, Ron. No doubt. Happy right. Father's Day, thank everybody. Thank you so much, Ron. Peace. Happy Father's Day. Talk to you guys soon. Take care.